Hands up if you live with a cat or a dog. Okay, hands up if you think they are not emotional. It is almost laughable, a question. I have had a couple of people put their hands up. I asked them to leave the room. And, uh, yeah, if you live with cats or dogs, you probably don't need much, much convincing that they're an emotional creature, that they're emotional creatures, and individuals, of course, and they're all different. If you took Fluffy and put Fluffy inside Squeaky's body, or, and, and you know, you'd come home and you'd say, what, that's Fluffy and that's Squeaky, that's weird, because they're different personalities, and they have different habits and movements and things like that. One of my two cats, Micah, was so traumatized following a vet visit that he went on a hunger strike for 40 hours and wouldn't come downstairs. And he wasn't even the one who'd been to the vet. It was his sister, <laughs> Megan. She'd the one who'd been. So through some sort of osmotic process, he, he could see the carrying case, he could smell the smells, but he hadn't been there. That's probably even freakier for him than, than for her who'd actually been. Uh, she recovered much sooner. And then later when the, 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 the roles were switched, she was the one who was more freaked out. A very interesting phenomenon. I don't know what's going on there, but definitely uh, you know, the, the knowledge of something weird that happened to this other creature was, was playing up in their emotions. But we don't have to rely on just anecdotes in our personal uh, interactions with pets, although those are very useful uh, to in inform us about animal emotions. A couple of very compelling studies that I describe in my book, one involves baboons, and this is a long-term Jane Goodall type study where these baboons have been studied for decades, so individuals are known over long periods, they know who's related to who, and in the modern era the scientists actually assign names to them instead of numbers like the old school way, thanks to, again to Jane Goodall for changing that, that approach. Because they are individuals. Well it turns out that, that female baboons who have lost an infant to predation or illness or some other reason show a very similar emotional and, or, well, physiological and emotional, presumably emotional response to, to women, mothers who lose uh, an infant. A very tragic event. We know we grieve uh, the loss and it lasts for a while. And it's reflected in uh, increased glucocorticoid hormones in the bloodstream for a month. That, and then they gradually subside, typically after about a month. Well, the same response has been found in these baboons, and they can measure it in a, in a more modern way of measuring it. The old way of measuring hormones was dart the animal, catch the animal, restraint, in blood sample, very stressful. It affects the hormone levels in itself, so not the best way. Now they can just collect poop and uh, use that to analyze. So it's a much better sampling technique. Um, and then and it shows, this study found that these baboons show exactly the same kind of pattern, hormone change pattern in the bloodstream after the loss of an infant. And just as we, um, others who know the grieving mother also share some of that pain and, and we also rally around. Similarly with the baboon society, uh, their uh, closest associates in the, in the baboon society also showed uh, these increased hormone levels, not to the same degree. And also they, they don't send flowers to each other like we do, but they increase, they expand their social networks. They groom more than when they didn't lose an infant. So they seek more grooming opportunities. They have more of these presumably uh, therapeutic, stress-relieving interactions. So some very strong parallels. Uh, what about birds? Well, cage birds become more pessimistic in their outlook on life. And this was shown in a study of starlings and uh, involves well, I'm not going to describe the method. It's too lengthy, but it's a clever method. It's been used on rats and pigs as well, and they show a similar pattern. It's known that humans who are in an impoverished living situation or depressed or feeling down about things are much less likely to try a new thing and to take chances, and simili similarly with these birds. The worst situation was uh, birds in a big aviary, a stimulating environment, social company, lots of interesting food. They, uh, when they're moved into a very tiny cage, they had the most pessimistic outlook of all. And what I think is really compelling about those two studies is that they, they undercut, they undermine a common assumption we make about animals, which is that they live only in the moment, just in the here and now. Just stimulus response, at least we don't have to worry about any kind of long-term feelings or emotions. But both of those studies indicate that they have emotional tenors, they have moods, they have dispositions that can last for weeks, even months. That shouldn't surprise us, but it does um, fly in the face of some old assumptions we've made about animals.